Well, 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 welcome to Back Chat. Dan Cons, Will Schofield with Hello. you. And we are joined by a West Coast Eagles Premiership player. Another one in the house. Another one. Carl Langdon joins us. Hello, Carl. Good, cool, Dan. How are you, boys? Very good. Very good, mate. Now, the voice of 6PR. Yeah, the here. voice of 6PR, the voice of – who else have you worked with? I mean, you've just been everywhere, haven't you? But I don't, don't answer. We're going to ask the first question. We're going to ask the first question <laughs> we ask. You won't be speaking at all this podcast. <laughs> we're going to ask the first question we ask all of our guests, Carl. Yeah. I know you're a big back chat fan, so you may know what this is. We ask our guests on the back of uh, this missing cricket ball, actually, <laughs> Dan Cons, great figures of five mm. – for Five 16. for 16 in a, in a grand final. Oh, yeah. We yeah. ask our guests your greatest sporting achievement. Now, yeah. we know you're a premiership player for the West mm. Coast Eagles. We know you represented your state, uh, both at footy and cricket. We're going to get into that a little bit. Mm. Yeah. But we want to know your greatest sporting achievement not on the football field. Eight for two. Eight for eight two. For two. Eight, eight wickets for two at runs. At what level? Uh, I was playing. Eight for two. That yeah, puts I was, you to shame. I was at, at Guildford <laughs> Grammar School. Yes. So we bowled them all out for 27. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we were playing Christchurch, so right. they were the opposition school. And I did take seven for 15 for Serpentine down in um, down in the in the country league be, whilst I was transitioning from Mandra to the city. So, yeah, bowling was fun. So, I mean, you're kind of cheating a little bit because you're a great football player. Like I said, 100 games for West Coast, premiership player – but you did have to make a decision about cricket, didn't you? You're a good cricketer in your juniors. Yeah. Well, I got on the under-16 Australian team yes. uh, and then played under-19s. Australian. My greatest claim to fame is against Victoria. And I know you've got a little bit of a, a, a passion about your your old state. Well, it's, no, it's my actual state. Victoria. Yeah, I'm I know. Victoria. Yeah, I know. You've told me True a lot blue. of times before. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I did, in a state carnival, um, contribute and took – I think two for 18 off 16 overs and made 74 with the bat, batting at number four. So that gave me great pleasure. Jeff Parker, who was a, a state player for Victoria. Um, but, yes, uh, the, the the big decision had to be made in 89. So, essentially, I was still playing first grade for Claremont Cottesloe, as it was then, Claremont Nedlands now. And I was drafted by West Coast at the end of 87. Yeah. So I played both for those couple of years, but then it just became too difficult. So... Footy was at that time, I think. Well, there was more in a team. This is why I was looking at it. There's only eleven in a cricket team, uh, and there's eighteen in a football team, and so there wasn't as many opportunities as there is now. So if if the same things existed yeah, back then in, in short form cricket as exist today, T Twenty, and that's it'd it. be a much tougher decision. Uh, right. You know, a decision that blokes like Sean Marsh uh, and Mitch Marsh have had to make during their time. Brad Shepherd's another one. Alex Carey, he yeah, was on the GWS list, wasn't he? Yeah. So they, these, you know, back in my day, there was Todd Bremen, there was Earl Spaulding, um, Peter Sumich, who was one of the best uh, Chinaman spinners in Australia underage. I played state cricket under 16s and under 19s with Summer. I played with Don Pike or and against Don Pike because he was uh, playing for the ACT in the under 16 National Carnival. So there's a lot of guys that had to make decisions back in our day, which might be very different if uh, the same landscape in the cricket sphere existed today. So back chat, we're powered by Fleet Network this year, Carl, and we ask you a question as well about your first car. Yes. Can you? What was your first car back in the day? So the first car I ever drove was when I was six years old because I live on a farm. <laughs> so <laughs> we had a mini, a green mini moke, and so, oh, so I, I had. Uh, the ability to drive a car before I knew how to ride a push bike. <laughs> so I was driving a car before I got my first push bike. Changing gears. <laughs> yeah. Changing gears, driving it essentially not too long after learning how to drive it on my own. So I would drive it from the house down to the shed. And the funny story was is that I reckon I was probably the next year, seven, when I got my first push bike. <laughs> and so mum showed me everything about how to ride a push bike except how to put on the brakes. Because you had to actually pedal in reverse. There was no handbrakes on this particular bike as there's a lot of handbrakes on bikes these days, no handbrakes on this bike. Yeah. So here I am, I'm flogging down the shed and I'm showing Dad how I can ride the bike and then I go around this corner and the gate's shut. So I didn't know how to stop the bike, did I? <laughs> so oh. smacked straight into the bike, really? straight bike straight into the gate. So that was my – never crashed a car <laughs> – but the first time I ever rode a bike, <laughs> I smashed the bike straight into the gate. Oh, that's funny. Andrew. So there you go. But my first car was a Ford Escort, a brown one. Brown. Yeah, which I had at school. What sort of tinge of brown was it? P 
poo brown. <laughs> yeah. Why and did they make the poo? I remember I old don't know. cars that poo brown. I don't know. And it was a two door, so you had to like flip the seats forward to get yeah. your mates in the back. And I had it at boarding school because um, it actually got bought for me by my nana and pop because I finished year twelve. And that was my gift. Right. And so I got that car. And then we had a family by the name of the Manchettis, and they were a very rich family. And one of the Manchettis uh, was driving a Rolls Royce, and he was a day student and he used to live in the city. So I used to get all the boarders because I was a boarder. So I used to get all the country blokes out of the boarding house, pile into my <laughs> nice little poo brown Ford Escort. <laughs> and then we used to have cannonball runs from Guildford Grammar School, him in the Rolls Royce. And me in my poo brown Ford Escort, and we used to race down from Guildford to Cottesloe Beach. And it was the first one in the car park, right next to Indi- what's Indiana Tea House, as you know it today. You would have all been safety first, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, no, it was always up. safety first. It was a bit like a few of the cannonball runs we had at the Hungry Jacks. That's another story. Feel at West afraid. Coast, a few years later. Like what? Well, like what? Yeah. Well, so when we used to finish training, uh, going back in the day, Will, uh, I don't know if you still get Hungry Jacks for free. Um, but I don't play there anymore, Carl, so I, I get plenty of Hungry Jacks into me now. Yeah, <laughs> so so we – well, mate, it was, our, it was our game food back in our day. I mean, we were flying ANSET and the food on ANSET was absolute tripe and there wasn't enough of it. You know, Laurie Keane was eating 15 lasagnas if he can. Did you see how big he was? <laughs> So we used to have we used to have cannonball runs from training when training finished out to H days H days. Now it's a big new one right near Ascot Racecourse. Yeah, yeah. It used to be an old shitty one, but it was the first one in the drive-through. Whoever got there first, right. and you would have heard a few of the stories, wouldn't you, over the years? Yeah, correct. Louis McKenna driving and so cutting off this truck driver and people three hungry jacks. Yeah, That's people, amazing. people, people running home from. Well, that yeah. was John O'Neill. So when we used to lose, he used to just put his back over his back and run home to Claremont because that's where he used to live. From the airport, Dan. Mm. Why? <laughs> because he got that disappointed. He hated losing. So he decided to he run used, it out. He used to punch us at training. Like you'd be in under a pack and he'd just drill you at the bottom of a pack. We'll come, that's what he was like. We'll come back to West Coast. I want to just a little bit more on your your upbringing. Like you're brought up yeah. on a farm. What's what's yeah. life like as a child for Carl Uh well, there's a lot of things that you could do back then you couldn't do today. So, like I driving told you about driving. Well, driving the mini. So, basically, by 10 years of age, mate, I was doing 10 hour shifts on a tractor. <laughs> so, I would come home from school at eight and go and get the shotgun and shoot a parrot or a galah, which I'd get arrested for these days. Yes. I'd pluck them, I'd chop them in half, oh my I'd God. tie a string to their leg, I'd throw them in the dam, and I'd pull them in and scoot behind them and get jilgies and then take them home and put them in a copper. Uh, at home, oh, or I'd weird. shoot a rabbit or a kangaroo. It was about eight to, to ten <laughs> at this period of time. Had the old Datsun Ute, um, which it used upgraded, to... It upgraded in cars. <laughs> 10 well, no, we had the Ute anyway. That was the work car. Yes. Um, and then, you know, driving tractors and trucks. Like I used to, probably at about 11 and 12, I would drive about 20 k's from our farm, which was out of town, to the Weybridge with a truck full of wheat and drop it off at the wheat bin and then drive the truck back to the farm. So you had my parents would get arrested if it was happening today. <laughs> yeah, but you grew up quickly then, right? You know what? This is probably the funniest thing. Not so funny for my mother, but I'm like my sister Kelsey and I. We once it got too late when mum and dad went to the pub, I, they we'd have to sleep in the car, and then mum would be driving home. This would be like when the pub shut. Yeah, mum would be driving home and she'd be like, like she'd be driving with one eye shut, mm. and I go, mum, I think I should be driving. <laughs> So here I was at like, you know, 12, driving mum and dad home from the pub. <laughs> safer to me to be – I can tell you, Will, it was safer for me to be driving than them, I can tell you. Well, times have changed oh. a little bit. So you did mention that uh, Guildford Grammar. So you're captain of footy, cricket, athletics? Yes. So you're a big dog at school. I mean, I'm just thinking about the kids that – like captain of all three things. It's yeah. the first time that's ever happened at Guildford Grammar. Yeah, it's just a good way to get out of class, really. <laughs> yeah, so you loved your sport. Yeah, so, you know, if you're in the first 11, you, you didn't have to go to school That's on a good. Friday afternoon uh, and then you played all Friday and Saturday and um, footy was always something that I loved to do. So I used to, as a boarder, I used to play from 15 Saturday and Sunday. So I used to play in the Hills Association. So I used to play for them on a Saturday yeah. and then play first 18 Sunday. Uh, well, sat- yeah, Saturday. Sorry, it was the other way around. First 18 Saturday and the Hills Association on the Sunday used to play for Parkerville. Yeah. So, yeah. 
It was just what you did. Um, you get drafted. Is it is it into the inaugural team? Is it at the end of 87? Or you picked up like yep. 87, 88, 88 so I, is your first year. So my first year out of school, in my third league game, I played a winning premiership. So yep. I started Colts, Subiaka. Reserve, Subi, winning premiership, 86, 86 beat East right. yep. 87 grand final, we lost to Claremont. Yep. And then end of 87, Bennett went to West Coast. So pre-draft selection because yep. they still had five players that they could pick before – Like a local pool, sort of what we're saying with GWS and Gold Coast when they yes. come into the comp. Yeah, so Guy McKenna, Chris Waterman – Joe Cormack and Troy Eugle were um, at that particular um, time the pre-draft selections. And, yeah, my first season was 88 and, um, yeah, pretty much got picked in round one, which was nice. What do you remember about that, rocking up to the footy club? It's Is it a, is it a footy club when you rock up? Or is, is, there, is no. there a culture? Is there training facilities? Well, we had no facilities. So we were just nomadic. We'd train wherever we could. We'd be at McGilvray over one training session. Then we'd be down at East Perth. Uh, we then uh, – John Todd was our coach. Uh, that's after Ron Alexander was sacked after only one season. Yes. Um, Toddy used to be a little bit different in his thinking, so we went out to Guildford Grammar to my old ground, Arthur Pexton Memorial Oval, and we trained there. There was no light, so it got dark. I remember Dean Turner scurrying off into the darkness to retrieve a football, and he tore his leg open, his <laughs> thigh, <laughs> tore it open on a star picket. Oh. It was sticking out of the ground. Uh, the ground was covered in cow shit. So, you know, blokes would be getting tackled in cow shit. And I don't know if you've seen what that does to you. If it gets in an open wound, it's nothing that you want to endure. So, yeah, there was there was all these sorts of things we we did. Um, and, you know, even when Mick came along, whilst it was more professional in 1990, the early days was very different. How did you – when there's like so much movement and, you know, there's you're training here, training there, it's going to sound like a dumb question, but – um, how did was someone just getting on the phone and yeah, calling was, every player individually? Or I was like, thinking that. There's no like group chat. You can't text, text, text the boys around. So how do you how are you finding out all this information? Uh, well, we just had it very clearly uh, drilled into us right from the start because you didn't want to be late. Yeah. Yes. Like if you're going to the nightclub on the day after the game, which was regular when I played, like, you know, we used to play to win and if you won, the reward was you could go out. And you could have some fun. In fact, we probably used to have some fun during the week as well, but we won't tell the coaches <laughs> that. But the thing was is that there was an incentive. So some guys would actually drive to training. Like if we knew we had to run around, say, Lake Munger, and we used to run around there and it used to be sort of a, a – a, sometimes it was a – depending on how we'd gone, but some days it's a time trial. Other times it was just a, a run get-together. Some blokes just sleep in their car. <laughs> <laughs> so they just go from the nightclub, which say the hippie club, not far, just <laughs> just in the car, just <laughs> sleep in the car. Uh, the the mm. I mean, um, I remember hearing a story. Where, where are you training? Where are you running at, at Ascot? Where, where, where are you doing laps around Ascot one time, early, uh, early 90s? I, I wasn't doing – uh, personally, laps around Ascot, right? Um, or but I remember, or but but in the eighties, right? We we lost to Essendon, and they kicked twenty six goals. We kicked one. Right now, Chris Lewis was the only player to kick a goal for us that day. I think I think people just think West Coast came in were instantly successful. Well, clearly no. not. No, well, not not this particular game, which was <laughs> uh, a record I think until recently. Um, <laughs> so it's good to see the team doing better than what we were. <laughs> But the thing was, is that after we lost that game, John Todd made us do 100 100s on the minute. Wow. 100 100s on the minute. Which for the first 10 on 20 is okay, but come yeah. 70 or 80. Yeah, guys are fainting. Different. Like he used to make us run Raybold Hill back in the day and like we weren't allowed it. there was no water. So if you've, <laughs> if you've been out on the gas and, and then you're all of a sudden you're running Raybold Hill, guys are just fainting on the side of the hill as they're running up the hill. But you weren't allowed to have any water. That was – that was if you could get through pre-season training, you could get through any game of footy. It was it, – pre-season training was the toughest part you, when I played. Were you ever full, full-time full footballer or did you no. always have another job? Always had a job. What sort of jobs did you work out of school? Uh, so my first job was in the Commonwealth Bank. Mm-hmm. Got robbed a couple of times. Uh, I'm come my back on that. second job when I – Pulled the pin from there after a couple of um, unfortunate circumstances. I went to AMP. I worked with AMP for a little while. Then I set up a, an insurance agency with Chris Mainwaring, the late and great Chris Mainwaring. Uh, from there, I transitioned into businesses. So I was doing a little bit of radio. So I started in 1990 at PMFM with Gary Shannon, 
um, and Paul Redman, mm. who's left us, and Amanda Walsh. Jane Marwick was also part of that team. Uh, did some uh, work on the side with Channel 9 and then went partnership in the Blue Note Tavern, of which was too small. We got done for overcrowding, too many Eagles fans coming. This was sort of early 90s. Uh, then bought the Wembley Hotel with Peter Wilson, Trevor Nisbet, Murray McHenry, who uh, yes. Eagles fans would obviously be familiar with, familiar with, chairman of the West Australian Footy Commission and another um, you know, great supporter of mine. And then um, after that went into building houses. Uh, so that was pretty much up to 96. And then after I pulled the pin, which I pulled my uh, – I got injured, pulled the pin on a five-year contract, only two years in, and I went to 6PR and I've been there ever since. Wow. So that bank, uh, working as a bank teller earlier in your career, mm. you were held up by one of the most notorious bank robbers in Australian history. The biggest bank robber in Australian history at that time in 87, yeah, Belmont Branch. What happened? So I parked my, at this stage, I've got a little red Ford Meteor, um, SCOE, um, <laughs> And the I, Red Rocket. Yeah. I, Andrew Ingalls, a mate of mine, was selling cars, Ford, working for uh, – uh, for was in the city centre, Ford, uh, with uh, a, a big fella, Brian Haywood, back in those days. So got that car and parked it. It's right next door is this beautiful white Cordia Turbo and I sort of stood there admiring it. Anyway, I go into the bank and uh, we used to meet at a cafe and so we met at the cafe and Brian and, and Nigel Minchin, who was my uh, branch manager, and I went in and we do a security check to see if there's any visible signs of anyone breaking into the bank. Then you come out, nah, so all the staff go in and sitting there preparing our, our day, you need basically four combination key locks. So you've got Nigel, you've got a lady by the name of Carmel Make, Tony Wally, who used to play a bit of footy for Swan Districts, and George Morton, there are four of them. They take off their combination key locks and Nigel calls out, tell us, ca- safe's open, come and get your cash out. Well, next minute, this bloke just drops out of the roof with a pistol. Uh, now, at this point, I hadn't seen uh, all, I could he- all I could hear was girls screaming and it sounded like the sound because we only there was no technology, just checkbook cabinets. They used to be full of checkbooks because you didn't have the – you didn't have the transactions available on your phone or yes. there was no internet banking or any of that crap. So it sounded like that. So I come running around the corner and there's this bloke, everyone on the floor blow someone's brains out. So I got carpet burn on my chin diving down there. And then I was just laying there and then there's this other bloke still up in the roof. So he passes off a sawn off double barrel shotgun to the bloke. So he's now got a pistol in one hand, sawn off double barrel shotgun in the other. Then this other bloke jumps out and he's like, his gun's going like this. Next minute his gun goes off. Next to Nigel's head, shot. goes into it, yeah. Next to it, shot it off. Yeah, shot it off for real. Real bullets too. Oh, went know. into the went into the uh, concrete, and then um, he gets Nigel and says, "Mate, we need the money." So dragged him and got his keys and opened treasury, as we would call it. And then Carmel actually walked in there, and then another shot shot off. It shot around our our strong room, and actually, thankfully, didn't hit anyone because they obviously. Um, built to withstand bullets and those sorts of things, but ended up lodging itself in uh, our treasury file, which was for traveller's checks, which was, again was a physical um, document that you had to – so it was a nice thick one, so the bullet actually jammed in there mm. um, and nicked off with pretty much um, two or three tins of money. Um, and then I chased out in the opposite direction so I didn't get shot. <laughs> they ran that way. I saw him going past the glass. I thought, I think I'm safe. So I jumped up and ran around the other way. And next minute I see these balaclavas in that white Cordia Turbo really? that I was looking at that morning when I walked into the office. So I uh, saw the car. So then that was the only piece of evidence that I could really give because I didn't see their faces. I knew what they were wearing. Um, but I had to go to the Supreme Court and testify. That was probably scarier looking at the guys that had been caught and In the court charged. Room. Yeah, and going there just saying, oh, I saw this white Cordia Turbo with number plate such and such, such and such, uh, because that was the only bit of sort of concrete evidence that I had was the getaway car. That was oh. scarier than the shotgun and pistols. Yeah. Was- well, I mean, the bit that I left out was that when, when – because it was taking a bit of time for Carmel and Nigel and so on to get the money. So you had – you had the scenario where he dropped out of the roof. When he got the sawn off double barrel shotgun, he was basically walking around to us blokes, putting it on the side of our heads, going, I want no heroes, 
pushing no buttons because I don't want a death today. Fuck. And I just said, well, it's not my money. Take as much as you like. <laughs> and he did. How much did they take? Uh, I think it was around 117000 at that particular time, like which I believe was the biggest um, robbery in Australian history at that particular <laughs> time. Yeah. I mean, you're a jovial character. You're on radio. You tell stories. But that's – that's pretty brutal for a young, young kid. Yeah, well, how's this though? I get a transfer to Subi Branch in Rockaby Road to yeah. be close to the training. And this joint's got front – at least at, at Belmont you only had one entrance. Yeah. So at Rockaby Road you had a back entrance which came off the car park and you had one that came off Rockaby Road. Well, so I'm working there and this time I'm in customer service and I'm just standing there and then next minute two blokes come in through the back door and get robbed again. <laughs> So I get carpet burned twice. <laughs> i got to lay on the floor again. <laughs> they weren't that good, though. They, ca- they, they just stole about six grand and got caught at the casino with their girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Put on hey? black. What do the, the boys think at training? You know, obviously, you're then going to train at West Coast. Are you telling the story? Are they believe in you? Well, they yeah. Well, there was no reason why there there was no reason why they wouldn't believe me because um, I think from memory going back to the next day, rather than us having to go to work, they took us to the old Melbourne. And that was a strip club going back in those days. So the Commonwealth Bank actually paid us uh, for the day to go to the strip club up in um, <laughs> up in the top of town there. The old Melbourne, have you been? I think it's near the QV1 is, yeah. building. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that used to be a strip club, like the Charles and a few of the so other just got held up. Henry Africa's. Head down to the strip club. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sink a couple of piers. Yep. That's where we went. Uh, let's get back into footy. Uh, so, sorry, just when you're doing these, you're doing these types of jobs while you're playing, <clears throat> and the conditions are, you know, pretty, you know, substandard. How do you then compare it to guys now that, you know, do you have those sort of like, oh, you guys don't know what it's like? Yeah. Um, what I had, mate. The conditions these days are sensational. Yeah. Like, there's not a blade of grass out of place. Uh, everyone's complaining about how hard the surface is. I mean, back in Shackleton, there was no grass. It was like playing on gravel. And all I then got to experience was in Melbourne you'd play and even playing at the Wacker, like you would play on – if it was hot and dry, those centre wickets would be rock hard. Dusty. I can still remember <laughs> Peter Wilson knocking – had his shoulder dislocated on a tackle onto the co- onto the basically concrete, concrete <laughs> and then he's sitting there and he's belting his shoulder, whacking oh. it back into place. Darren Creswell from Sydney, do you remember him yeah. knocking his kneecap back into place at the Is SCG? That, that, oh, that was SCG. So, so there's those instances that I can just recall from seeing, in some cases, being on the field firsthand. But yeah, it was it was completely different. Now with drop in pitches, the young blokes don't know how lucky they've got it. To be perfectly honest, nickname Boris, Boris Becker won Wimbledon right. in 1987. It's a lookalike. So that essentially came more from my cricket mates because right. I was still obviously playing cricket then. But then it just transcended into into footy, and then of course I died at blonde. So when did that happen? What, uh, are you looking at Boris Becker? Yeah, just look at I him. mean, that's a current day yeah, version. Like back in the day, he probably looked like Carl back in the day as well. Dan's yeah, Googled a yeah, we'll seven-year-old see. version. No, no, we'll see. He's copying me now. <laughs> yeah. he, he's decided to go my colour. So he's just come back the other way. But when, 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 you, when you're dying your hair, what's going on? Well, so 87 was Mark Jackson. Because he had white hair for a long part of your career. Yeah, so so this is what happened. 87, <laughs> right? End of 87. Um, and it's I'm still playing for Subi. And the Subi boys, of which there was a few of us country boys that were living in a house together. And so uh, it was on Salvato Road. Would have been mild behaviour, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, mild. Well, this is the night before the game. So we're having a few bourbons. um, (laughs) As we would. The night before the game. Yeah, night before. Uh, Getting prepared for the big game down at Freo over the next day. So we're having a couple of quiet ones and playing some cards. And then the boys dared me to dye my hair blonde because Mark Jackson had returned. And he was, you know, one of these guys that was well-renowned. Larger-than-life character. Yeah, coming back from Melbourne. And he was playing for South Fremantle. So I said, okay. So then um, we rang one of the girls who worked for Morris Mead and she comes over to the house and while we're playing cards, she dyes my hair blonde. And the (laughs) next day I then run out onto the ground and start sort of, and I'm thinking, Jacko's playing forward, I'm playing forward. 
what am I going to do? Because we don't have this rolling down the field wheel. Back in my day, we used to actually stay close to goal so we could actually kick a goal from 50. Hey, hey, come These at me. Days, I'm, I'm, I'm just played the game. Yeah, I know, mate. It's not your fault. It's the coach's fault. Now the coaches want to make, wear their forwards out so they're tired when they're shooting for goal rather than just rest near the post. But anyway, um, so I think, well, how am I going to get him? So they were doing their warm-up, so I sort of ran out sort of near him and around them and Pre-game. started, yeah, before the game. Got underway when they were just warming up. <laughs> hey, Jacko, here you go, mate. Because he had this really squeaky voice. You've heard his energizer yeah. battery ads. Oh, well, You've got to roll it. them in. I'm a bloody. Have you seen the highway? I'm, I'm man? an original. Yeah. You don't know me. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm an individual. Yeah, you can't it. fool me. Yeah. So I started doing all that to him. He didn't like it. Then obviously we played the game. We won the game. We went to rumors, went to the nightclub. Um, he comes in. He had a couple of minders because he was doing a movie back then called The Highway Man. He's a big dog. He was a big dog. Yeah. Well, he thought he was. Minders. But he had these big minders and he I want to fight you, Langdon, at the entertainment <laughs> centre, he says. So he wanted to fight me. Like he a wanted, boxing fight. Yeah. He wanted to get it because he, he'd had a couple of boxing matches against a couple of other blokes, a couple of rugby league blokes, I think. Anyway, he wanted to get that on at the entertainment centre, which f- held about 4,500 people. So eventually I talked him down. I said, I'm a lover, not a fighter, and set a couple of shooters up on the bar with uh, uh, Bobby Marr, who was uh, one, of the, one of the owners, and Dennis Barberich, who was uh, the, the bloke that used to manage that particular joint and talked him out of it. You clearly liked having the blonde hair, though. I mean, you didn't, you didn't let your hair come back. You kept it. No, no. Well, the, you stri- liked it. the strike rate was all right. So, um, <laughs> you know, maybe blondes do have more fun, Will. <laughs> Very good, Carl. Uh, footy. Um, your left footer, your centre forward. I don't think people know how good you were. I think yeah, potentially our audience don't know. I watched some highlights of yours before we had a chat here. You were a gun. Well, you were. It, I depends, know, I, it I, depends what day well, you see. I, some of the highlights I saw, Dan may not have seen them, rolling around your left foot, smack, smacking goals from 50 yeah. as easy as you like. Buddy Franklin sort of comes to mind when yeah. I'm seeing some of the highlights. Yeah, the worst part was is my job wasn't really to kick goals. Right. My my job was to be a distraction right. to those that actually could kick a lot of goals, like Peter Simic. Right. Like, you know, um, so I would generally be trying to run off the edge of the centre square and pick off whoever I could. Right. Um, so hopefully you'd have Kemp or Matier or Pike or Lamb or Maney or whatever running through and you could try and – I mean, you didn't have to necessarily smash them to pieces, mm. but you could just run past them and you could make a bit of noise as you're coming through. So just whatever sounds you could make <laughs> to actually just make sure that they were aware of you were coming. You would have got a few, though. Well, I didn't actually take out, to be honest, that many. I mean, I, I got Stephen Silvani and got five weeks. Um, I, that feels like a decent punch. Yeah. I took out, I took out the probably Geelong. probably worth 10 these, these days. I took out the Geelong runner. So <laughs> I, was the thinking? first, well, I was the first bloke to ever get reported for striking a runner. In really? AFL, yeah. What happened? Well, you, well. so his name's Dean Schutz. So we were playing at the Wacker. It was in about 1989, I reckon, and he was delivering a message to Neville Bruns. Yep. And Summer had just kicked a point, which wasn't unusual. So then Neville Bruns <laughs> is listening to Dean Schutz's message. So I thought, I'll just you know, be my stupid little yeah. self and I'll just yeah, lean in and have a bit of a listen to the message. And then Dean Schutz says to Brunsy, he said, you lead and I'll block for you. And I'm listening to him, aren't I? So, of course, Neville Bruns leads. Dean Schutz tries to block me. So instead of me doing anything else, I just cracked him in the side of the head. <laughs> like and a punch. Yeah, I just punched him straight in the head. <laughs> Bang. There was no, well, there was no rules for hitting runners. Right? So, so he goes, he's, he's half concussed, right? So he's, he's waddling his way back to his bench. Anyway, I get reported for striking the runner. Got thrown out on the Tuesday, got thrown out. Why? Well, there was no rules for striking runners. <laughs> oh I'd read the rule book. <laughs> Guess what they did the next day? They changed the rules. Can't strike Guess runners. what happened on Thursday? I had to go back to the tribunal. Bullshit. Guess what happened? I got three weeks. What? Bullshit. No bullshit. Retrospectively gave yep. you a, that's, yeah. Wow. Wow. True story. You would have been livid about that. Well, I was livid. I was the first bloke to ever get done trial by video for tripping. Do you know Do you know how many weeks you copped over your career? I got 13. That's not too bad. Yeah. No, not too bad. How no. many do you reckon I got? Uh, I don't get much. How many did you get? A, a four. Oh, that's, that's pretty nothing. well behaved. Louis got 28, I think. <laughs> Chris Lewis. <laughs> you were that, you see, so the point I was trying to make, though, I think you have a reputation of, you've said it yourself, being a bit of a dickhead and distracting people and – you know, clipping blokes, but you're a good footballer as well. So you kicked a lot of goals over that period. 1990, you had a good year. 91, you played for your state in and around there. 
91, you don't play in that grand final. You played most mm, of the games that no, year. I broke my arm. In the mm. finals. Yeah, that's why they lost. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Or at least that's what I tell them. It was them. in the semi or something, wasn't it? Yeah, it was against Melbourne. So my arm just slid straight and I heard it break and then I came off and Doc Rodmore says, put your hands up. So I put my hands up and he goes, whack, on both hands. I go, ah, oh, that didn't feel very good. Oh, so, that yeah. was the test to see if you'd broken something. Just yeah. hit, hit the hands. Yep. Did you fly with the team over? Because that was at Waverley 91. Yes. That was the angry Anderson in, yes. the, in, the, in the Batman mobile. Yep, I'd been playing with a broken foot. Well, I had stress fractures on top of my foot, so I'd had a, been someone, getting injections. Someone did that, someone did that to you. Well, they? that was Buddy... Jerry, Dwayne Russell. Dwayne Russell. Yeah, he's a commentator these days. So I've t- yeah, I've told this. But anyway, I, so I was having because he used to back. They used to have metal sprigs. So one thing that these old Victorian blokes used to do is back up on you and just put their studs into the top of your feet, try to crush your feet. So that's why I didn't feel bad when someone had a hold of my nut, nuts at the bottom of a pack, and I'm just belting Ken Higley in the head. I got two weeks for that, by the way, for whacking him. <laughs> but that's the only head I could see, and someone had hold of my. You know what? So, I mean, what would you do? Yeah, probably the same. Kind. That's right. Yeah. So, um, look, going back, it was very different to how it is now. And for the same sorts of things that blokes were doing back then, now, they'd probably get six weeks. Did you fly over for 91 grand final? I did, yep. I had a broken foot and a broken arm and I lost my hair because I tipped West Coast to win. And uh, that was a bet because I was working on morning radio at that point. Right. Um, and, yeah, I ended up bald. So I then had I had a, a broken arm and I'd had an operation on my foot and now I'm bald. <laughs> Prime condition, really, what yeah. a year. And you lost and your team lost the grand final. Thank God we won the premiership at ninety two. Correct. So <laughs> you come back off ninety one missing that grand final, which would have been disappointing. Again, I know you're a larrikin and like having a laugh, but that's yeah. you've got to be disappointed playing most of the year, getting injured in finals and not being able to play in a grand final. Yeah. But then you fight back ninety two. Yeah. You're playing a premiership. What's well, that year like? Well, you know, not just just before we get in ninety one after the grand final. Yeah. So you asked me whether I was there. Yeah. So broken arm, broken leg, bald, mm. and Malthouse sprays me. Why for talking too much? Why just because I talk too much in the up post match? Just talking before in the lead up because I was doing things for the radio station outside Flinders Street right. and going to all these different appearances and all this sort of stuff. And obviously, we lost. That's so my fault. Really? So he How did just that go? he just piled on me. I used to pile on me anyway. Like he used to, he used to pick his targets. So some guys, if you pick on them, they just curl up in a ball. Yes. If he picks on me, guess what I do? Other way. I fight. Yeah. So if he wants to have a crack at me, I'm going to take it out on them. And my motto was, if I'm going down, then I'm taking one of them with me. <laughs> so if I'm losing, one of them is losing as well. That's fair. I, That's always fair. I saw some ripping footage post your career. You're in a press conference. Mick Moldhouse, who bristly at the best of times, mm. you've obviously asked him a question and he's not happy with it. You're no. sitting in there in your 6PR polo, yeah. probably no that doubt. That was the first one I went to. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first press conference I ever went to. Mick's looking around the room and he looks straight at Carl and he goes, is there anyone in here that wants to ask me a real question? Because I certainly don't need to listen to this bloke over here. Yeah. <laughs> and he's pointing straight at Carl and they yeah. cut the camera to Carl. Carl's yeah. just nodding his head away. <laughs> like, look at him, like, he's like, just smile at him. Go, yeah. That was the first pre- press conference <laughs> and I couldn't believe how much bullshit he used to spin. After games, because he he would say one thing to us, and then say something <laughs> completely different to the media. Yes. So I just asked him the questions that I already knew the answers to, to be perfectly honest, just to see what he'd say. And in the, instead of actually answering the questions, he just started attacking me <laughs> and started asking me questions, and then just wrote me off. And that was the last press conference. I never went to another press conference after that. Really? No. That was the only one I ever went to. By your choice. No, I just, I just didn't want to. I didn't need to go there and listen to something that I knew wasn't true. Does that still happen to this day? You reckon yes. coaches? It does, yes. right? I Absolutely. mean, I, I, I see it now. Yes, exactly of the same thing. Of course, it does. Why? Because you don't need to. Like, if you've got a sore finger, yes, and we don't. No one else needs to know about it. Why? Why, why it pisses should pisses me off? Why wouldn't you though? Why wouldn't coaches just get up and go? Carl's got a sore finger. He's not playing next week. He's got a sore finger. Because. You, you might would, have a sore finger and you might keep playing for the next 10 weeks. Yeah, but no one can target it anymore, Carl, because they get reported. You're not allowed to yeah. target it to players. It might have been back in the day. That's true. What about That's like true. transparency now with, like, for instance, Nick Nat Nui, like, you know, West Coast, oh, yeah, we'll be back, we'll be back. You know, like, coaches, obviously, there's no real benefit, I feel, to keep that stuff secret. Like, do you think there should be more transparency around those sorts of things? I know that your co host hates late withdrawals. Yes. And, 
I, I'm, I'm of that um, opinion that they know. Like Zach Tui, I even, even earlier this year said that this is a strategic um, replacement. It's a little bit like Jade Gresham on the weekend. Jade Gresham's dropped. Next minute, he's he's playing in the team. It's all strategy, mate. Because he was never dropped. Um, so, look, in the end, if it affects an opposition's team's planning and it's within the rules, you do it. And and all the coaches are doing is exploiting a loophole that is there, which we'll continue to talk about unless they change it. That's correct. It's like you're punching the runner. Wasn't That's the right. Runner. It was a loophole. Loophole. <laughs> <And> they, <laughs> closed closed the, they closed the loop. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> it's a punch funny. too. Uh, 92. Talk to him about it. The year mm. uh, is, is the team – you know – West Coast have had this pattern that you know you got to lose one to win one sort of. I mean that's that's the pattern that's followed. Ninety one, two thousand five, two thousand fifteen. I agree with what you're about to say. I don't think that's true, but you ha- you did lose one and then won one. What's the- yeah? Oh look, I think nineteen ninety was the year that was the one that got away. To really? Me. Yeah. Well, because if we had of and we didn't, but if we had of been able to win that game against Collingwood in nineteen ninety then our path through to the grand final would have been different. Um, but we went back the replay the following week and, and got rolled by 72 points, I think it was, in the replay because obviously all finals had replays at that particular time. Um, and so then we had the harder road and flying backwards and forwards probably in that period of time. And it obviously wasn't professional, so it was a little bit different. Yeah, it Got us. So I reckon we were probably better placed then even though we won all those games in 91, but we, we had, um, I don't know, we just we just lost a couple of key players towards the later part of that season. Mm. But 92, I just think that a lot of things went right for us. Like we had our best players available, which you obviously need to have. Um, and I think that when you look at the final series and you look at the performances of, say, Suma, who... You know, I think he kicked six on grand final day. Peter Matera kicks five from a wing. But you look at Dean Kemp and you look at Guy McKenna and you look at a lot of the talented big men that we had and most of them only young. I think Mitchell White, Ash McIntosh and Glenn Jakovic were all like 19. Mm. 19. And that's our spine. We're a couple of years before we didn't have them. So I think that you know, we were better equipped in 92. We were able to keep the better players on the park and – Got the job done. You'd been there before, but the grand final parade, there's some footage of that rolling around 92. Mm. You've got a baby's dummy in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a pink dummy. I've seen you a picture well, of your so pink dummy I, in your mouth, the grand final parade, day before the grand so final. So you have been in one of those grand final parades in an open back car. Yes. And so you... Feedback is, is given from the crowd, quite a bit of it. So they were very close. And it was crowded. And so this Geelong supporter pulls that pink dummy out of his baby's mouth <laughs> and he leans over and he goes, suck on this, Langdon. <laughs> so before, hands quicker than the eye, so before he could actually pull it away, I've grabbed it out of his hand and started sucking on his baby's dummy. <laughs> Imagine that in a COVID world. Hey? <laughs> Didn't you spend the entire parade with it in your mouth? Yeah. Every time they abused me, I just kept sucking on the pink dummy. <laughs> Thank God we win. Imagine the spray Moldhouse would have given me if we'd lost two years in a row. Oh, God. Hey. Well, he was a motivator, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah well, you blokes walked to the – there's a couple of stories here that I've, I've heard maybe maybe from you or someone else. So you stay uh, at the top of Punt Road there and you're right on the edge of Hilton the MCJ. on the park. Chair. Yeah. What's it called now? Something yeah. different. But So you guys walked to yeah. the ground. Yeah, so we used to get in the bus and drive to the MCG and we'd stay there like – Really? Yeah. Like it's like a it's a two hundred meter walk. Yeah, not far. Yeah. So we we went for our captain's run that morning. Yeah. Right, which was around the oval. Yes. And so there were people already pulling up, parking their cars, and great already Geelong, great on, Geelong people. Yeah. Or yeah, great Geelong people. Yep. It's beautiful. No place. teeth. Like already <laughs> already drinking VBs. Like I remember this bloke in this white station wagon. He'd already got his deck chair out, and he was right near the park. And we come through. And what time um, is this? Eight in the morning. This is like eight in the morning. Yeah. Anyway, challenge buddy Maney, because at this point, like, we were, there wasn't a lot of sort of like talk going on. Like, it was a little bit quiet. Um, and you this guys, was before. It would be pensive and big, yeah. game, big game, day of the game. Yeah, day of the game. And it, and it's like pretty quiet. Anyway, this bloke buddy starts at Maney and then challenges him to, to scull a VB. So, guess what he does? He sculls the VB. <laughs> so then. That actually got everyone talking because we hadn't had breakfast or anything at this point. So he'd had that before breakfast. And so 
then we then everything starts to have open a up a bit, yeah. have a bit of laugh. People started to talk. There was a bit more atmosphere, and I reckon that was one of the reasons why we won too. So I was about to say because then we walked through the park, and then these little bloody Geelong kids they had West Coast wankers written on their flags, and then <laughs> they're like. 10 and 11 or 8 and 10, and they start running around us and Jacko's already got his baby all on. He's ready to eat children. Did he like, have it already? He, oh, mate, he had his mullet. Yeah. <laughs> like, they slip off, Carl. That's what he used to say. That's what I said, what are you doing that for, Glenn? So, yeah. I see um, I see one of the, the big buddy. Um, he was pretty oiled up the other night. Yeah, he's slick buddy. No, he always oils up. He oils up. up as well. Yeah, they got people rubbing him down and oiling him up. Yeah. But you, that, you didn't that, give it a crack, the oil? No. Nah. That no. walk to the stadium is Not outrageous. Field, that would anyway. never happen. I've seen the footage. You guys are in your, your canary yellows and blues walking down. Um, didn't someone, when you got to the gates, wasn't someone offer it? Like, didn't they have, they have cards or something about the, around the West Coast wankers or stickers? Wasn't there stickers being handed out? Oh, I don't know about the stickers. I, I remember I remember these flags. I remember the kids doing laps around us. Because you blokes used all of that as motivation for that day, yeah. for that grand final. Yeah. Well, the only the only other thing was the war story that Malthouse told us, and he said, you know, you'd start with a, a, a C company. He used to read a lot of war stories, and he told us his story about C company and – you know, if you if you can if you can run, you can walk. If you can walk, you can crawl, and did all that thing. And then at the end of it, he gave us an A4 piece of paper, and on that A4 piece of paper was an army insignia with the words under it, "Death before defeat." That's what those words said. So, right. I just remember then the game starting at half time, and we were two or three goals down. And I go to my locker, just to put my mouth guard in there rather than put it in my jocks and my shorts or like other blokes. You know yeah. how they used to do that. Yeah. I don't know what that's all about, but anyway, that's. Um, <laughs> Something I never did. I'd just leave mine in my mouth. Yes. And the way you take it out to take a shot on goal. No. Anyway, um, so I'd put it in my, in my locker um, and then I see this piece of paper, A4 piece of paper with the words death before defeat. And, you know, the, the, the main reason that I think we won the 92 grand final is the fear that if we had a lost that game that Mick Malthouse was going to kill us. <laughs> 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 Oh, man. You had a good day, game that day. Played well. Four, well 14 possessions, uh, uh, two uh, behinds. Uh, as, well, well, did you see where I was trying to kick them from? <laughs> I probably should have um, passed them off to a teammate. But, yes, um, look, set a few up. Scoey, uh, Tony Evans, only two goals, I think, came from hand passes. One was a knockout where McGrath tried to kick uh, the arm, which I had broken only the year before. He just about kicked it in half. Um, Peter Matera twice. I dragged down Besto, uh, laying a, a nice one percent tackle. Peter Matera picks up, runs down the field, kicks a nice long goal. You know, but do I get any credit? Nah, don't worry. <laughs> well, Nothing. We're giving you credit, Zero. mate. We're giving you credit. Thank what were celebrations like after that one? Uh, I reckon it was fifty-six days in a row. <laughs> yeah, fifty-six. Yeah, I reckon fifty-six was, strong. Was there like uh, the? the were you aware of like the weight of like winning a first premiership? Was that something that you guys thought about much or? Uh, well, for the first few years, all I used to read was articles calling us West Coast Weagles right. from the East. So I don't think that they thought that we were ever going to be good enough. And then we started getting very competitive because it didn't start out that well. And then when we took it, it was the end of the world, to be honest. Mm. And being front page of the Herald Sun, which has got me with my bleach blonde hair, <laughs> holding this like premiership cuff, cup with my West Coast Eagles scarf, with a West Coast Eagles scarf, um, like to actually then come home from winning it to landing in Perth. Oh, and by the way, on the way back, like – we were able to drink whatever we wanted on the plane. Mm. So, you know, if you had bourbon or whatever. I remember being – I was the flight attendant actually on the way home because I, I just morphed into Frank Spencer. Who's Frank and Spencer? So, well, he's Michael Crawford. So if you've ever seen some mothers do have him, have you ever seen him? Ladies and gentlemen, we're here we are on a flight. We're flying back to Perth. Oh, Can you please put your seatbelt on? Like so, <laughs> no clue. If you go, if you go, if you Google him, you got your computer. Oh, yeah. you go, go online and have a bit of a Google, and yeah. you work out who he is. He used to have a wife called Betty, 
and he had a dog. So you sounds like you turned into your alter ego on the floor. Yeah, that's right. Oh, God. And I used to do it all the time. <laughs> do you wear but a anyway, beret? Hey? Do you wear yeah, a beret? Green beret? Yeah, beret, yeah. And he's also a fan of the opera. So uh, if you – but I can't sing. But he, he, he could he, – he could, uh, he could sing. So Michael Crawford is Frank Spencer. So Michael Crawford is a fan of the opera. So, but that was his. So you character. started serving piss on the plane. <laughs> yeah, I was just driving up and down, you know, with my cart <laughs> and steering it into areas. How badly is it? So, so, so this was the thing. So we got anyway. We got back. So off track. was the general no. public on the plane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> full of normal people <laughs> and us and Carl. Yeah, we were all celebrating <laughs> big time. So anyway, we got back. And then Brearley Ave, which is now shut off as you drive out to the airport. So that was the old route into the airport. People had parked up their cars. So we landed, come out. People had parked up. And all the way down Great Eastern Highway, seriously, from the airport to Subiaco Oval, where there was a, like another 15,000 people. Yeah. But all the way along Great Eastern Highway, people were just pulled up, backed up on with their cars like that bloke from Geelong, yeah. drinking beers out the back of their, <laughs> out the back of their cars <laughs> all the way along. It was yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. So to actually see that, you just then realised how significant it was. And then afterwards you saw a vision of grand final day and there was like no one on the street. Like in Perth there were shots taken – of what people were doing. It was the quietest the city, I reckon, ever was. Really? Yeah, it was just bizarre. You Once then, you saw it all unfold. You then, uh, so you played in that 92 flag. Post that, you played eight games? Yes. And Nine career, surgeries. Career done. So that was your 92nd game in 92? Yep. And you finish your career at 100 games. Yep. So you had nine surgeries. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think I probably, oh, I don't know, it could have been 13. But I had, yeah, I just basically just fell apart. So I had three on my right knee. I had um, a subluxing big toe. I had plantar fasciitis. I had conjoined tendon repair of my groin. So it was just really all leg injuries, which if you can't train, you get, you know, you don't get the level of fitness that you need. As I said, preseason is the most important part. Mm. You get through preseason, get through any game of footy. So um, that was just it. Um, and then back, I had a really bad back. So I had rhizotomy, nerve freezing in my back. Um, and that was the end of it. I, Peter Sumich dropped me down a cliff, like my wrist still knackered. What do you mean down a cliff? Well, I was climbing up it, and he decides to fall over the top. So I, I fall five metres down the rock, because I would already I was climbing up, and he was my support at the top. You know, it's rock climbing. Yes. Yeah, so I'm climbing up. He's at the top. He's my support. He falls over the top. So <laughs> oh I then gosh. go five metres, smack my wrist. So I played with a Mark Lacra guard, and he's had the <laughs> operation that I didn't have where he actually had his – has his wrist pinned. I haven't had mine done, but yeah. I probably should get it done. But anyway. When, when you were um, playing footy and working at the same time and you're getting injured and stuff, is it stopping you from your jobs as well that you're doing? Uh, not not really. I think for the most part, like, you just get a procedure done and go back to work. Yeah. It's a little bit like now. I mean, I've had a few operations since. Um, and, you know, you have an arthroscope and you're in hospital for maybe a day or two and then – you're back at work. I mean, if you're working a physical job, um, but thankfully I've not been really um, too much involved in that since since I finished school. There used to be some cracking paid sponsorships back in the day, like some cracking marketing opportunities for you. <laughs> but do, is there any memorable ones? Didn't you didn't you fly didn't you fly into a stadium one time? Didn't, yeah, didn't well, you, but, well, didn't you zip line down into a stadium? No, no, no. So I got I lobbed in a helicopter. So, but that was when I started the ground announcing, which I'm still doing now, 28 years later. Right. So, uh, because I uh, I still had years to go on my contract, there it was a Pepsi deal, and it involved me wearing a gold suit. So I retired in February, and first game in March, I flew in to the ground in a helicopter that landed on the ground, and I jumped out of the helicopter. With a gold suit on, <laughs> bring back that sort yeah, of pre-game great. entertainment. And that was that was my that was my launch of the ground MC work, which uh, I'm still doing. That's so huge. You're rolling around with a gold suit. Yeah, get but rid of that e- the fake eagle. It, you know the VR eagle. Bring back Carl Langdon <laughs> flying in, under, in a chopper. <laughs> well, I went from a gold suit to an ochre suit because then the club went down the the ochre path. Yes. But it was a really o- ochre. It was the ochre, yes. like shiny ochre. <laughs> color. Wow. It was a horrid looking thing. Um, and then they went to club merchandise, which started to evolve because there was a lot less club merchandise going back in these days. And 
um, yeah, now I'd call it relatively normal clothing than what I had to wear back then. I've seen lots of. It could even be. Oh, look at this. I always forget when we've got the old boys in here to roll this out. Mm. This is a football record from. Uh, Looks like 1998, so you're done by this stage. You're great mate there on the front page. Yeah, well, we used to have a calendar. I should have brought in a couple of things for you. We were actually nude in the calendar. <laughs> like a team we calendar. Do, yeah, yeah, we used to have cookbooks. Um, I've seen lots of these, and yeah. you, you feature heavily in them. Well, I had chicken a la carl as one of my favourites. What's that? My favourite dish, chicken a la carl. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little creation. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah. Uh, what what were some of the rogue things that went on back in the day though? I don't know how many you can tell, but where do you want to start? Well, I don't, just just some 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 old old footy stuff that maybe wouldn't pass today. I don't know, like even some of those. I'm assuming there was cashies rolling around. I'm assuming there was uh, um, from that side of things. But then you know the, the 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 drinking during the week. I mean, I know that's not accepted now, but that used to be part and parcel back in the day. Oh, look, if you could sneak out, you you know you would. I mean, it was all about getting to the contest, Will, as you know. I mean, you know, you, like the things don't come to you laying home on the couch. And there was no social media or any interaction. So if you wanted to actually meet people yeah. or, you know, catch up with anybody, then you had to go out. <laughs> or, or otherwise you, you had just an old maybe pay phone that you could walk down the street yeah. and get on the old pay phone. Yeah. So that's how it was. Um, so I think the, the days of where um, people, young people, do that, it just astounds me why they want to sort of sit there talking with their thumb all day yeah. rather than actually just picking up the phone and ringing someone. Like why type all the words into your phone when you can actually go and talk to them yourself and meet them face to face instead of getting on Tinder, Thank you, Dad. for example. It's, Thank a, fear, you, Dad. it's you know the fear of I mean? rejection. Hey? It's the fear of rejection. Yeah, but we're not, you just we're get not, to the next contest. We're not breaking down it's, social. It's, not, it's like it's like Nike. Like, well, you ask the question, so this is my oh, thing. But I want it's no, like getting to the contest, Will. I don't want to know about society's problems. I want to know what happened back in well, the day. Well, that's what here. I'm saying. It's like getting to the contest. So the only way you could the only way you could score was you had to get to the contest. Okay. Right? So that's what it started off with. So going out, having that sort of fun. The coaching um, just turn a blind eye to it, or are they, you know. Are you sneaking out? Or? No, well, you didn't sort of sneakily do it. Um, and if if the club found out about certain activities, then generally you'd get fined for it. But as I said, for the most part, back in through that period of time, we were winning more than we were losing. So did, did, you know, Chris Mainwaring actually got told by Mick Malthouse to get off the drink, right. right? Get off the drink. Not allowed to drink anymore. About a month later... He actually, in front of all of us, tells him to go back on the drink. <laughs> and you know why? Because he wasn't getting a kick, right? So this is this is just what used to happen. You blokes used to roll out to rumours and hippie club yep. in your tracksuits. Yep. Is that Straight correct? off the plane. In your West Coast like, tracksuits. Yep. And they'd be like, Graham Hunter, when we used to go to the Racket Club, which used to be down in Northbridge, there'd be like a $1,000 drink cart back in the 80s. There'd be like a thousand early nineties. Sort be, of reception you're getting in rolling in your West Coast suit in, into, into Kings. Are you Kings rolling in? Yeah. Well, well, I said to you before, it's just about getting into the contest, <laughs> right? That's what you had to do. It's just outrageous. Imagine dog. nowadays, I've like, got just problems all with the boys it. rolling in. Like, got West whacked Coast a few times. Like I got whacked a few times. Like at the casino, I'm sitting there, and there there was this old um, raised bar at the casino, which used to be right behind the gaming tables. Yeah. And there's been a lot of redevelopment since you blokes were born. You probably weren't even born when this was all there. Mm. Um, so uh, I'm sitting there and next minute I get crunched here, right? Some blokes just with their right has just smashed me straight in the side of the head, oh. right? And turns out, like the bouncers came. I didn't get to swing a punch back, would have liked to. But um, the the bouncers came and he punched me in the head because his mate stared him to. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was, it, you know, white, blonde, easy to hit head, not right. identifiable much. There's, you footy, know. there's footage rolling, That's around, what happens. rolling around on the field. Mm. You guys have won a game. You're over east. The fans are on the field because that used to happen. Mm. And a fan is fighting you. Yeah, Carlton. Carlton, Carlton match. <laughs> You're fighting a fan. So I'm coming off the ground and this bloke is punching me in the back. <laughs> and at that point I haven't looked around. And, and our bus driver, uh, Donny was his name. What, our was, bus, what was Donny out in the Well, field? because he used to drive us everywhere. This, this, We had the same bus driver for years in the early years. So he used to do the driving. So then he sees the bloke that's whacking me. So then he sort of comes in. And then next minute where but there was a lot of people, but next minute we were relatively close. That same game, the 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 
um, group of people who were um, in some way, shape or form involved, they actually surrounded our bus. So they wouldn't even let us drive out of Princess Park. Oh, <laughs> I mean, things that, things that we used to do, like John Todd, like we used to fly over at midnight, we used to get there at midnight, and then we used to go and train at midnight with no footies. So we'd go across and we used to stay on, uh, I think it's, is it Flemington Road that goes in through North Melbourne? Maybe. That goes yeah. past yep. Princess Park? Is yep. that right? Yep. And across the road there was a, a hotel. And so we used to stay at this same hotel and then we used to go and train across the road in the, some of the open grassed areas and like we'd start about 15 metres apart with no footies at midnight. Yes. This is the West Coast Eagles yes. at midnight, no footies, 15 metres apart, and we'd start with handball. No footies. No Pretending. Footies. No footies. So pretend. Yeah. Let's go, let's go. Handball. So left, right, left, right, do that. Then then he'd say, Toddy would say, right, oh boys, kicking. Out you go, 50 metres. So we'd stretch it out to 50, right? Should have seen my right foot at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody brilliant. So so we would backwards and f- – no, this is no bullshit. What? So then we'd be backwards and forwards and we would start – we would start – Kicking, right? And then next minute, you'd be like leaning back and Troy Eugle, he just spirals run, one off through the trees and he runs off. <laughs> a fake a fake ball. Hey? A fake footy. This is the footy, yeah. Oh, the, now the, you've got a real footy. No, no, no footies. No footies. <laughs> just spirals run through. He runs off through the trees. He comes back about five minutes later and he's got his head down like this. And John goes over to him and says, Troy, what's wrong? He says, John, he says, I couldn't find the footy. <laughs> <laughs> Are you blokes? This is this is this normal like, at the time. Yeah, You're like, oh, this, this is this seems fair. Just enough. driving past the driving past some grass, seeing <laughs> twenty it's, blokes. It's called it's called simulation. It's called visualization. You probably hear this in NBA, but oh I tell you what, God. I don't know if John Todd was ahead of his time or not. It's like John Warsfield. He blindfolded the players, and then uh, he also got me to come down to Eagles training. John Warsfield and commentate. Mm. When Michael Braun was shaving every part of his body, yes. So I was getting all this inside information, and some of it was given me to to me by players, and then fed to me by the coaches, and then part of the idea on this particular day, and this is going back through a period of time that was a little bit tumultuous for the football club, is that uh, the idea of me calling training and calling um, putting putting the players in an environment that they. You should have seen they're flicking me the bird and everything. Was, what you you were? I was just sledging the hell out of them. <laughs> from yeah, it where? Was the best, from the commentary box. <laughs> it was on the loudspeaker oh, <laughs> over the good. ground. Bullshit. Yeah, no, true story. What, what was Wush, what was Wusher like then as, <laughs> as a teammate? Because he seems like a pretty oh, scary guy. Like off the field, he was a chemist. He was a mild man. You've probably seen these pictures of him when a young bloke. He had these black, thick. Um, you look like glass. Yeah. You look like nerd. Well, he was. Well, that's what he looked like, but okay. you wouldn't say that to his face because when he uh, when he came from his chemist, it was like he and took that bloody white coat off yeah. and then came onto the footy field. He was just a completely different person and he was just hard, strong physically and mentally, but, you know, you need mental strength for physical strength. So that was one thing that uh, he always had in spades. Little, You know, he, Peter Wilson... Um, probably two of the strongest mentally um, capable players that I played with during my time, I reckon. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned that bit about beating the media, sledging the boys. A little bit about you know post footy. Uh, you're currently six pr uh, breakfast with Millsy. Um, I'm not up early enough to listen, unfortunately, Carl. Just looking after the kids. Normally they're up early, Scoey, so there's no excuse. Yeah, correct. I like sleeping in, though. Uh, you transition out of footy um, into the media. Are you surprised more players don't do that? Because not many do. Well. Yeah, but I think that... You've had, a, you've had an extended career in the media. You know, yeah, it, it depends. Almost. Yeah, and look, there's others that have transitioned and aren't there for whatever reason. But, I mean, it's pressure. That's always part of the landscape. You're only as good as your next contract. I mean, I've never been on since I left school a contract longer than three years. So, and so that's essentially always been even even my footy playing contracts. I mean, the one well, I did have that one, but I only lasted two. But um, from from an overall um, getting out of the spotlight perspective, if you do something in the media, you're always in the spotlight. Mm. Where if you transition into something away from the game, I mean, quite often I'll have people ringing me at work. Saying, well, where's Craig Turley these days? Hmm. 
what's he up to? What's Paul Harding doing these days? Where they know and have known people have stayed involved in footy, which you know applies to a number of my teammates and and maybe yours, Scoey, that get involved in football clubs and work in some role in the game because the game is so broad these days. But I think for the most part, um, it's not easy. That would be the first thing that I would say. Um, there's not that many former players that go down a commentary path. There is a, a few of the younger guys coming through now, like you know Lee Montagna, and uh, but you know for the most part Brian Taylor and 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 Dwayne Russell, mm. who we spoken about before, um, sure. James Brayshaw played cricket and then transitioned into commentary a, around that way. Um, who have you got? You got Sean Darcy who does a bit. Nathan Brown, Luke. Luke Darcy, yeah, not sorry, sure. Luke Darcy, who does a bit of it, but there's not that many guys that actually you know move into it. One because it it's a bit of a skill, mm. uh, and two because you're still in the spotlight, and you know whether you're, if you're brave enough to have an opinion, as you'd know with Kane Corns because he's always got one, mm. uh, then you're going to expect a backlash. Yeah, and that's why you've got back chat. That's correct. There you go. Backlash from back chat. Great. Um, social media. Let's do it. I think it's time. Social media, not social. Yeah, I can see yeah. this one. We like yeah, that. I like it, yeah. Right, we <laughs> ask the people to ask the questions of you, Co. We've heard enough from Dan and I. Yeah. We want the people to ask. And apparently, Nick tells me there's some good ones here. I usually leave these just to hear them fresh here. But a couple of good ones coming right. up, Dan. <clears throat> DJ CO74. Who was the best player to mouth off at you? Uh, Craig, Craig Kelly by the length of the Flemington Strait. Why? Uh, what sort of stuff did he roll out? <sighs> Well, it wasn't, it wasn't just verbal, though. It was physical. I reckon he headbutted me about six times at the Wacker, and I came off like a conehead. Like I had all these lumps on my forehead. Oh, my God. Because he's like one umpire. He can't see, can he? Like if he's up that end, then he's not going to see what happens down that end. Were you provoking, Craig? And there's – well, of course. <laughs> like there's no point in not provoking people uh, to, to actually, you know, get their focus off the game. But he was, he was one of those guys. But, you know, they – There'd be things brought up about the good. The thing about Collingwood was they would somehow always get pretty good intel mm. about you know right about private that, life stuff. Yeah, yeah, and they they didn't mind go, like whether it's about your mother, your sister, your right. cousin, your whatever. Yeah, right. so it was pretty much it hurts when it's true. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. I've rolled out a few truths out there. I reckon you would have as well. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, it <laughs> depends what you can find out. But were you that sort of player where you would you would take people on front on, and you? But then would you be able to have a beer with Craig after the oh, game? Oh yeah, yeah. We, well, we did the promotion up in Darwin in 1990, the year that we got done for betting on David Hines to kick the first goal. Sorry. Well, David Hines is supposed to be playing at fullback, hmm. and this is why gambling isn't allowed on the AFL because we had first hand experience. So I'm not playing, and I see that David Hines is paying $26 to kick the first goal. Right. So go back in the rooms and tell the boys. And Hinesy is playing full forward. Right. On the team sheet, on the on the thing, I'm saying, hey, boy, Hinesy's 26 bucks. Who wants to be on? So the boys went and got all there, <laughs> oh collected, a quick, collected a quick thousand, <laughs> went back out there with uh, a, a, an old footy manager at, at, uh, at West Coast. And um, went around a couple hundred bucks on each of these bookies at, at $26 and we got the chocolates. We won 25 grand. He kicked the goal. Yeah. Did they feed him? Yeah. Well, what do you reckon the rules were? <laughs> how, how else were we going to win if they didn't feed him? No one else is kicking the first goal. So he kicks the first goal. Anyway, the AFL found out about it. So we won 25 grand. The AFL found out about it. And guess what? We got fined. Did you have to- 25 grand. Bullshit. Yeah. So you have to give it back. Yeah. And that's when they changed the rules. So again, loopholes and loopholes on your car. Yeah, yeah, half the rule book is just because of Carl Langdon. <laughs> you, you, you've just got to be first in a few of these things, Gary. <laughs> just give it a crack. You never know. Uh, that's great. See, there you go. That's yeah. what I want to hear about. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, Rob's underscore mob. Uh, do you still have the gold suit? Um, no. And you got to okay. Well, then uh, the next sold question. it for two thousand at a club auction, signed by Ben Cousins. Really? Oh, that's yeah. huge. Should be worth twice as much now. I was going to say, think? worth more than that. I wonder if he wore it on a few of his ex- escapades. <laughs> Guzzy out at hey. a hippie club in a gold suit. <laughs> <laughs> hey. What a king. Just Cuzzy rolling into hippie club wearing a gold suit. You'd get applauded for that. Yeah. Um, Ollie underscore Ma. Uh, how much have Bonds paid you for portraying the Bonds chesty man? The Bonds chesty man? The the oh. icon, I think, that maybe there's some... Oh, oh. look alike. Oh, really? I got compared to um, Bart Simpson. <laughs> um, I actually had a playing card with me and Bart, I think, sitting I mean, next to pretty... each other. 
Oh yeah, well maybe 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 back in the day they could, they could be worse. I need, to, be, I, need, I need to go to the gym a bit yeah. more oh, now. Don't tell me. Yeah. Uh, John underscore Dawson. Uh, so I'm trying to find my tape. How important was it to do dummy leads and bumps to get Summer into space? Yeah, that was very important. Mm. In fact, if if I wasn't getting out of his road, I was probably getting dragged and sitting on the pine. <laughs> so it was always important to leave that vacuum behind. I mean, him and Hetty and um, you know having all of their opponents trying to kill me. Was the um, was the priority? Yes. Because generally, if I was going for the ball, three of them would come and try to smash me from all directions, and potentially those players are free. L underscore captain. Uh, run us through the ninety five Granny v Subi. Oh, this wasn't good. We got well. So what happened? So you missed ninety four. Yeah. At West Coast. Yeah, I still played 95 grand final at Subi. Right. Because I was, I was injured for most of 95. Right. Um, so I'm playing centre half forward. Right. And Paul Mifka starts attacking Jason Heatley down in the goal square. Yeah. So I say to Todd Curley, I say, Todd, go down there and get Heatley, sorry, get Mifka off Heatley or I'm going to punch you in the head. Um, so essentially he told me to get mm. whatever – and I just punched him in the head. And Seems like it was a move. So then next minute I've got probably about 13 West Perth players punching me. Um, and I think I was the only player reported on the back of all of that. And uh, I got two weeks. So, Did you yeah. Win? No, we lost. Oh. And Todd Curley took mark of the day. <laughs> Over the top of me. <laughs> Late in the game. <laughs> Sounds like so, I time knows all about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, before we get to one of our last questions on social media, got a bit of a photo to show you, Carl. Um, how about this for a bit of a stitch up for you? I don't know. Uh, you don't usually get an input into footy cards and what goes on them. I don't know if you've seen this one. This is pretty rogue, though. Is this the one where you're my not eyes, looking well? Is this the one where I've got a red face with my eyes closed? You look like you've yeah. been partaking in potential yeah. activities. Yeah, I don't know What's why that? they turn those into footy cards. What is going on there? Yeah, Stimmerol. You look that absolutely was a, that dreadful. Was chewing gum, I think. <laughs> So maybe it's stuck in my eyes and, it, and my eyes are like, I'm trying to open them with, can't get the stim roll up. You know what I mean? Well, uh. <laughs> so, I was just tired, Scott. I was worn out. It was a hard day. <laughs> so good. Did we win that day? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the egg man, let's finish him off. Uh, how do you like your eggs cooked? How do I like my eggs cooked? Yeah. Uh, I must, I'm not fussy. Food is fuel. And so I am not fussy whatsoever. So I've had like eggs a lot of ways, um, fried, scrambled, poached in the – what do you call it when it's inside the bread when you put it in there? What Damn do you call right. that thing? Oh, Dan. Dan. What do you call well, that? you cut the hole in the bread. Yeah, what's that? Frog in the hole or toad in the hole? Yep. Yes. Toad in the hole. Uh, look, really don't care. So uh, egg's probably the wrong thing to ask, to be honest. You told me uh, – I'll ask you a question to finish yeah. us off. Hmm. We did a show, SEN, we're doing Sports Day for 6PR, you know, the SEN offices though. Uh, was it my house? Uh, it might have been. <laughs> Can we tell? I've got, got a story for Patreon uh, that Carl and I'll tell just for our VIPs after. <laughs> that was very good that day. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that was very good. Uh, no, another one. I made an instant coffee mm. and I just put coffee in and then I just put some milk and hot water in. You claim that you had the... The, the, the instant co coffee recipe well, mate, can't be beaten. Where's your? What have is, you got a microwave? What is it? Tell, tell all the people. Okay. I argue so it. so back on the farm. Yes. Back on the farm. Yes. We used to have bushels. There was only bushels instant coffee. Now yes. you've got all of these wonderful different Organic instant coffee. Organic. Different yeah. instant coffees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's just go Macona. Yep. Macona yes. coffee. Fancy. Right? Do you like it? Hate it. You hate it. Dan's a instant coffee. Instant coffee is disgusting. Yeah, okay. Dan, Dan's no, a, yeah. well, a you're going to have one of my coffees because I'm going to make you one. Okay. And your, I could get your your fancy coffee that you mm. think's really fancy, and I'll get you my instant coffee, <laughs> which you don't know is even instant. He reckons it's bad. But it's all about the milk. It's actually not the coffee. So if you pour hot water straight into instant coffee, what's going to happen to it? Burns it? I don't know. Burns it, doesn't it? I don't know. Or does it? Well, yeah. I don't. Burns it. Potentially, it can, depending yes. on how hot the water Science is. Science says yes. So, so in the end, it's all about the milk. Mm. So, my nana used to boil the milk back when I was on the farm. So, with the introduction of microwaves came the instant coffee phenomenon. So, you can get the same look from an instant coffee that you can get from those beautiful barista coffee, where it's just all about the milk. 
Right. So if you've got some instant coffee here in your studio, mm. straight after we finish the show, okay. I'm going to make you coffee snob. A coffee okay. that you will enjoy. That's us done and dusted. Backchat double <laughs> underscore on socials. Uh, you can find everything we do at backchatpodcast.com.au. Send us an email. See all of our stuff there. Uh, sign up to Patreon. Become a patron, a VIP member to hear a great story between Carl and I, which we are going to tell Carl. I don't care if you don't want it. Fleet Network. We are powering the podcast. Uh, thanks to Swimply. Thanks to Whippersnapper Whiskey. Thanks to Margaret River Roasting Co. Blue Bet. Shelter Bro- Brewing Co. Leadable Cameras. Uh, I think that's it. We're done and dusted. You have fun? I did. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Carl. See ya. You're a good man.